<laughs> okay, so the last talk will be Mining Legacies in the Southeast Greenland with Ninis. Do I need uh, three people? Oh, there's, there's, I can just hold it. You can use this one, but you can also use that one. Okay. If you don't want to switch between. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Is that good? It's challenging little oxygen in here, but uh, uh, we're three speakers, so we're going to challenge the speak talk uh, set up here, uh, but we like to contribute, all of us. Um, I'm Nines Rosqvist, and uh, we have Kalle Östelin and Jarki Jorsha from uh, Physical Geography here. So we will now go to, we will actually stay in the same place, just next door, the fjord just uh, north, north of the Ica fjord. Uh, by accident, we were at the same site almost at the same time this summer. And I just heard Rick had mentioned he's going back, so if you need any hands. Uh, we're studying a project dealing with mining legacy, because now we're in an area of Greenland where human impact has really been very obvious for a long time. This is close also to where the Norse first came to Greenland and started farming many years from now. But there's also uh, a lot of mining activities, past mining activities and potential new activities. Um, and we are interested in what you can learn from past extraction projects because the demand and prices of minerals today, especially the rare earth minerals that we need to the green transition, ironically enough, is increasing the interest to exploit the resources in the Arctic and in Greenland. At the moment, there is no mining activity, actually. Or during the past 20 years, I don't think there's been any projects that has been approved, but there's a lot of interest. So how do you study this? We are working in a, in a, a project across disciplines. Um, so we are the natural science component. Um, and there are social scientists, economists, anthropologists, and uh, a nice mix of uh, people. And part of this research uh, project um, staff went to Greenland this summer uh, to uh, study a few sites on the southwest coast. Um, and it included... Um, assessment of the sites, but also interviews with people living here. What do they see for their future? Are they pro-extraction or are they, how do they, um, uh, what kind of future do they see? Um, so uh, the, what kind of footprints does the mine leave behind? And what can we learn from that now that we have even better techniques, of course? Um, was there any uh, remediation after the mine has been closed? And uh, is there any repurposing of the mines? Can you use the infrastructure or even the buildings to something else? Can you, ex can you make a tourist attraction of it? And how, you can, how can you use these kind of infrastructures that are left behind? It's the same everywhere. It's not just particularly important for the Arctic, but this is uh, the focus of our study. Also because the environmental impact is, is usually very strong. So um, I'm not so sure. This, this rock is, uh, is a unique rock. It's one of the few that has been mined to it, uh, it's, uh, the end of it. Although uh, there's only been one mine in the world uh, mining cryolite. Uh, it's named cryolite because it looks like ice and it's mined close to ice. Um, and it's the place uh, up too close to where Rickard was, Ivitut. It's quite a, a famous uh, site for mining. And then we have an uh, old copper mine uh, in Josva. And then close to uh, Narsak, there is a potential rare earth and uranium mine, which is being discussed at the moment. So um, Jarek and Kalle will, will take you along a trip to those sites. So it's fantastic to see what your colleagues did because the previous presentation was in this fjord and we were about three kilometers across the mountain in this fjord. And I will also show some of the drone maps we did in that area. So we've been doing very similar stuff for different reasons. So this is a picture from one of the two sites from Josva. It was a copper mine for only about... 10 years, from 1904 to 1915. And so at these two sites, um, I've been doing uh, drone mapping and making ortho mosaics uh, to get data for archeologists and hydrologists. Because the satellite images in the area, they're not really detailed enough, especially not for the archeologists. So we made maps with 
two centimeter uh, per pixel resolution so that you can uh, much easier map features of archaeological interest in these maps. So this is one of the ortho mosaics we did for the Josva site. And then for Evitut, the, the largest site just next to the Ica fjord, we also made a um, ortho mosaic of the whole mining system. The big blue hole there is where they used to mine the cryolite material. Then everything else is where they put all the materials from the mining site. Um, and from this ortho mosaic made from the drone, we can also get very high resolution elevation models, which can help Jarke. Yeah, so, so the question we have is, uh, you know, which kind of environmental impact do we have then from these mines? So it could help us understand, you know, if you open mines again in Greenland, what will the future impacts be? Uh, and also if we understand the mechanisms, we can understand the impact of climate change and so on. So this is, uh, here we see the fjord uh, outside of the mining area. You see the open pit uh, near the, the houses there. And uh, actually, uh, lucky enough, even if, it, if it's rather remote place, there is measurement series in blue muscles uh, of metals. And you can see that there are really elevated concentrations of lead and zinc in some places in the blue muscles. And uh, it's still the case. So the question is, what is the mechanism now that you know, this historical mine is still polluting the, the fjord? And so far, uh, the hypothesis has been that uh, it's a tidal water effect. So you can see, of course, you mess around a lot when, when you do the mine. Uh, actually, lots of these minerals were shipped to Copenhagen, where it was processed. So that's kind of you know, surprising that they didn't have the on-site processing, but they needed a harbor. So they took a lot of material from the open pit to build the harbors, to build the, the infrastructure. And we can see that the highest concentrations of, of metals actually is, is, is then close to the harbor. And we have another hypothesis, and that is that, you know, it's, it's not only the tidal water, it's also local infiltration. Because we don't have main streams, actually, it, it goes around this area. And we think this hypothesis is testable also, because then we should have a correlation, for instance, with precipitation events. So we could see if, the, if we would return and measure things here, we could probably see uh, if things fluctuate and have a correlation with, uh, with precipitation. Uh, but uh, then, you know, we would be interested in also making uh, some assessments of the total amount. Where did all the stuff end up? So just a small part, of course, was shipped to Copenhagen. The rest is somewhere here. And to make an impact study and project into the future, you know, how long will the impact be, we would uh, need to do some mass balances of, of, um, of what remains of, of the waste rock. And then your model comes into to play again. Yes. So. so what we will try to do then is, this is a snapshot of now what it looks like now, but what we want to understand is what it looked like when they started, because we want to figure out where the biggest volumes of, of waste rock is. So uh, this is a map from 1921 from the company archive, from the mining company archive in Copenhagen. And this is what the, um, site looked like back then. So what we want to do now is overlay it with our orthomosaic from today and try to see where they deposited most of the material and by that calculate how much waste rock we have and where to support um, Jerker's findings. W this can also be cross-referenced then from archaeology studies or historical studies from the company archive because they will likely also have all the figures of all the mined materials so we can get sort of a better verification about the mass balancing we calculate on the basis of this. Okay, so um, in this uh, picture, this project, we mainly focus our work on northern Scandinavia actually, but uh, this Greenland study was very interesting and the basic conclusion is that we don't, we don't learn very much at all from what we've done before. We have many mines in northern Sweden and Finland. 
which were operating for a few years, 100 years ago, and it's still super polluted there. And even if the mining companies today promise that they will re-establish whatever was there before, there's no techniques to do that. You can't. Uh, and it's a very um, uh, actual problem these days because now there, there's been discussion of mining in Skåne and in other places where people are, are, uh, have emotions for the, for the landscape and want to have alternative ways of using it. So it feels very relevant to bring up this kind of... Um, this is far away, sure, but we have the same examples very much closer to where we live. Uh, one interesting project here is close to Narsak. It's, it's called Kvanefjeld in Danish. Uh, it's been some test um, mining here for uh, rare earth minerals. And unfortunately, also get uranium, or maybe some people would want the uranium. Uh, but this site is located just upstream from a village and from a, uh, upstream of a fjord system, which has been sustaining people for hundreds of years for fishing. Uh, then the fish disappeared because the water got warmer. And then people were very pro-mining because they don't have any jobs. And of course, we, we then met with uh, young, um, young people in that village and they, or town. They really said that before they wanted the mine because they would get jobs, they thought. And then now the fish is back and they have changed their mind. They want to have the fishery back. <laughs> but it does, they can't because the infrastructure for handling the fish is not there anymore. So they're really... Uh, tightened up between this kind of ironic uh, management of uh, natural resources, I should say. So it's the same uh, in, in our countries that we have to make priorities. What do we want? How many minerals do we want? And at the same time, climate is shifting here, changing the patterns of precipitation and temperature. So it's really a challenge to assess the impacts of these kind of operations today when you have, a sh when you have shifting baselines. What are you going to compare to? It's going to be a different world in the future. And this was a very good example. Uh, so uh, there's some pushing for this mine, uh, and especially from Chinese companies. Um, so the Chinese wanted to buy the military station that also Rickard used for his logistics, uh, which was very close to the Ivitut, cryolite mine. Um, and the Danish said, uh, because the Danish didn't want to have their military base there anymore, it was built there to protect the mine once upon a time. That's why there is a military facility there. And then the Chinese came and said, we want to buy this from you. Then the Danish said, no, we're going to keep it. So they have five people there now. But they're very pro-science, so a very good site. Anyway, then there is also interesting, because this area is also visited by the Hurtlirutten, so there is um, a lot of uh, tourists, wealthy tourists, coming ashore, looking at this legacy, hopefully learning something. Um, at the same time, there was one fisherman there uh, still catching fish in the fjord, which has been uh, very polluted once and is still probably. So this is, uh, this is very interesting to see what, what, what is sustainable in this sense. Should people go? This ship was on its way to the Northwest Passage because ironically enough, the discussion and the narrative is now that the Arctic gets more accessible and therefore we can extract more of its resources at the same time as climate is changing. So we feel that this project, with the, with the width of, of uh, science we're using, is very uh, rewarding and very interesting. Now we're, we're writing papers now, basically. And the cryolite is uh, to be an ice person, to have this, um, it's, it's a nice thing. <laughs> anyway, thank you. That was it. Thank you. So that was actually the last talk in this session, as unfortunately Margaret Hansen could not make it. Do we have questions? So what is cryolite used for? Oh, I forgot to say, sorry. It uh, was used to produce aluminium. It, there is a sodium aluminium fluoride thing. So first they used it to, to get extract the aluminium out of the actual mineral, and then uh, it was used in the process of getting aluminium, and it was very important for during the war. It was a really, a, a, and a for long they said this was the only place on earth that this existed, but there are f a few other places that this mineral has been spotted, but, but not mined. But they took the whole ore away. The problem was that they 
the, the waste rock, they crushed, they did the crushing there. And uh, we picked up some samples to test for the contamination in the ground. It's huge. It's, it's zinc and lead, like Jake said. So the waste rock is the problem. The actual mineral is gone. They used it, they crushed it very finely, and they even had it on their tennis court. But at the end of the, the mining there, they even scraped the tennis court free from this material because they really wanted to use everything they had. So it's really not, any, well, this was an unusually big piece I found, uh, illegally <laughs> transported. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Jär Jerke lost all his rocks. <laughs> Because they scanned his rucksack in the, in the customs. <laughs> so we're sharing this, actually. And the copper, of course. The copper mine was copper. Uh, that was even worse. That was really, really high. Nobody's cared to do any remediation there. But this is, was for aluminium. Yeah. We have some more. Yep. Hi, um, I, I'm an ore geologist, so uh, I have a kind of comment on what you said. I, I think there'd be many mining companies in Sweden who would not be particularly happy with hearing that uh, the, the dealing with the environmental problems with mining hasn't changed over the last <laughs> centuries. <laughs> well, th I, there's always an environmental impact from yeah, mining, yeah. but um, I think there are very many strict regulations in terms of dealing oh, with yes. these things. That's, and that's not what I meant. Mm. But there are lots of cases where mines have been uh, operating like 100 years ago yeah. and it's still very polluted in the Absolutely. environment so yeah. uh, because the companies themselves go bankrupt because mm. the prices go down no i didn't mean that that, that was yeah. not my intention no i mean it's it's good it's just it's a very like you said at the beginning you know um the use of uh, metals for um green technologies is a huge question and uh, we can import or export the environmental problem to countries like china because that's where we import all these metals from so we have to take an aspect of the environmental impact, I would say. Yeah, great. No more questions? Okay, then I think we can thank all the speakers with an applause.